Franny and I had the awesome privilege of, uh, we had a, uh, a daddy-daughter picnic, Father's Day on Friday. Yeah, oh, that's so sweet. And we were chilling there, I was chilling there. And I got there a little bit before Pastor Ren. Here comes Pastor Ren with, he had a beach umbrella. He had speaker for music. He brought, I, I'm looking at, they thinking we bougie up in this church. I don't know what he's doing to us, you know what I mean? Everybody was all jealous. Look, look at that guy that was all hot and everything. We're in the shade. It's your fault when they start talking about us in that, in that school, you know what I mean? It's going to be your fault. But praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, open it to um, Romans chapter 12, if you wouldn't mind. We'll jump into today's word. When you get there, say amen. 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 I see some old school Bibles in the crowd. Amen. Bring that Bible. Bring a big Bible. Hit the person next to you with the Bible. Remind them what the Bible looks like. See, the people that have electronic, they like, come on, why you got to do that to me? You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, uh, the more and more I, I just um, go about my days, I don't trust technology like I used to. I know we're really dependent on it, but um, get your Bibles open, man. Church, I don't know if you feel it today, but I feel like, uh, I feel like it's a, like, um, forgive me, but I think uh, there's a, a spiritual slumber in the atmosphere right now, meaning there's just this laid back atmosphere. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's maybe because the vacation time has come or whatever and everybody's just laying back a little bit. Um, but I'm going to encourage you to fight through that this morning, okay? Amen. I'm going to encourage you to not think about what you're doing after service. Don't think about what's happening and your vacation and what you're going to do here and there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to fight the fight in your mind and stay focused, get focused, Okay. Because I believe that one of the, uh, you know, the Bible says that we are not to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. We should know that there are times that the enemy will play with our mind. He'll try to, you know, I, I keep going back to Samson and this fact that, you know, when, when the enemy took Samson's strength, he was docile. He was on the lap of Delilah and she was stroking his hair and he had no idea that his power was going to be gone that day. He had no idea that that's the day that the Lord was going to remove his strength. He was there quietly, and Delilah stroking his hair, putting him to sleep. And I have to remind you, church, that we are still at war. We are living in a time where battles are ever increasing all around us. Now is no time to be spiritually asleep. Now is no time to be lazy in your spirituality or your faith in the things of the Lord. Now is no time to stop fighting. Now is no time to put down your sword. If anything, I don't know about you, but I feel like the times are getting short and things are getting a little harder. And I feel like the fight is increasing. And I know sometimes it's hard to be fighting all the time. But I'm here to encourage you, don't stop fighting, church. Don't get discouraged. Don't take a break. I know it's hard, but Pastor Sam, you don't know my problems. I get it. We all go through things, but don't put down your sword and don't start fighting. Don't stop worshiping. Don't stop praying. Don't stop getting in your word. Don't stop that intimacy. It's easy to do those things in these last days. Are you with me this morning, church? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we've read these a bunch of times. We've heard these a bunch of times. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I'm reading for the NASB, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me pray. Father, I pray right now for this house. I pray for whoever's watching us online. I pray for whoever will watch this message at another time. I pray, Lord God, that you would just, Lord, I, I spoke to the young people on Friday, Lord, and I told them that you've called us to be lions. You have not called us to be docile little sheep that get pushed around. Lord, you are the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are a lion. You are strong and mighty, fearless. And I pray that, Lord, you would impart into your people that we are to be the same 
We are to be powerful and mighty and fearless. We are not to be tossed to and fro by the things that happen in this world. As your word says, oh God, we are called to be like you and live like you and walk like you. So Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak to your people. That you would continue to call out a people in a church that are called to be mighty and strong. Not weak and useless and lazy. Oh God. I cry out to the, the Alpha, the Omega. I cry out to the Holy One of Israel. I cry out to the beginning and the end. There, Ty said it, there is one name, and we speak to that name. We cry out to that name. We pray to that name. Jesus, Holy Spirit of the living God, come and dwell in your people. Do something in your church, Lord. It's getting dark. You are the true light. Come and enlighten us today. Speak to us today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Before I preach, I want to tell you about this Tuesday. We are going to go on another prayer walk this Tuesday and evangelize. Come out this week. This past week we had a good time. Stories of people just waiting for others to be confronted with someone. I'm going to tell you, I, I did not go out with the team I have a bum ankle right now, so I limped myself around a few blocks here in Jersey City, and I did what I said I was going to do. I prayed for a few schools. Let me tell you what happened to me. I, I wound up going to the school. I don't even know what it's called. It's McUffle, McDuffle, Mc something over here on this. McAuliffe. Forgive me. I was just looking at like Mc something. That's what I remember. And I walked past, and it was an interesting day because it was also primary day in Jersey City. So I, as I, I didn't know that when I started walking up on these schools, and I want them to think I was a crazy about the, you know, so I just started laying my hands on school. But I had an opportunity to pray for the agenda. And I thought it was a divine thing that the Lord set me on. And then I come across the, Mc, you know, school. Mc, 28, that's better. See, I grew up with numbers and not names. Amen. And I come across, and I lay my hands on the door, and the, there's a lady, a guard on the inside. She goes, hey, do you want to vote? I said, no, I'm not here to vote. She said, what? She started coming close to her. I said, I'm just here to pray for you and the school and the kids. She goes, oh, my God. I said, what, has nobody been praying for our children? It broke my heart as I walked away from the school. So I'm going to encourage you to come out this Tuesday and let the, our city see us praying for it. Even if you don't speak to anyone, let them see. And I carried my Bible. And I said, I'm going to carry my Bible as I walk around. So they can see there's a guy walking around, and they may say there's a crazy guy with a Bible. I don't care, but I want them to say there's a guy, and I hope I can speak to someone, and they, there's a guy at least who cares to pray and talk to people. So come this Tuesday, 630, for pre-prayer. Come and pray for a while, and we'll, we'll have a plan, and we'll go out. Church, there's no use being filled with the Holy Ghost, coming to church all the days of your life if you don't talk to someone else about the king. What you're really doing is becoming fat and lazy and spiritually, and, and I can't help but to think that the Lord will make an account of that one day. Say, man, you didn't talk to anybody about me? I don't know about you. When I got married, everybody knew that I met my wife. When I met, when I, when I whoo, couldn't tell, you know, because you got those eyes and you're glowing. They mention the name and you start to smile and you start to, the toughest guy gets all whoo, soft inside. Should be the same way when we talk about the Lord. Let me tell you. And if you have, don't worry about, I don't know what to say. Just tell him what he did for you. They can't take that away. So this Tuesday, amen, you hear me? We talked about evangelism. Now it's time to be about that business. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 12. We read it, therefore I urge you, my brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. I want to talk to you. The title of my message today is Sacrifices, Idols, and Altars sacrifices, idols, and altars. I, I've been very, um, I've been, uh, I had a conversation with Miss Nadu a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to be really honest and frank with you that 
she, she, we were talking about King Josiah. She brought King Josiah to my attention. We just started talking about King Josiah and how he was a reformer and how he was tearing down different things that the fathers, the kings before him had done or whatever it may be. And, and we just started talking about sacrifice. And, 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 and it's just this crazy thought that, that, that back in the day, you know, that people used to sacrifice to idols and sacrifice to, to really carved images and, and wooden things. And, and then, then we, we sit there and... and and we, we uh, just talking a little bit. And I said, you know, Miss Nadu, I said, the truth of the matter is, is that the devil's plans for people and how he treats them hasn't changed at all. It, it may, he may have changed the way it looks. He may have changed uh, the way we see it. But, but this, 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 this idea of sacrifices and idols and false altars, it's not a new idea. It's actually been happening for thousands of years. And I start to just look in the Bible of, and, and you know, the first, uh, the first instance that, that I get of, of an idol is in Exodus chapter 32. You know the story when Moses is on the top of the mountain, right? He's up there doing his thing with God. The people had seen God move. He brought them out of bondage and out of slavery in Egypt. And here comes Moses down the mountain and his servant Moses, that man, Mo, uh, I mean, I mean uh, Joshua. Joshua goes, says, hey, Moses, I hear a sound of worship in the camp. You know the story, guys. If not, you can look it up. And, and Moses. Moses goes, and Moses being, I guess, this wise, this discerning person, he says to Joshua, that's not worship I hear. I hear something different. And he comes down off the mountain, and he finds that they had made a calf. They had made an idol, an image. And the people, if you read the account, the, 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 the people say, Aaron, make something for us. We don't know where Moses is, and we don't know where God, whatever's happening. And it's funny, you know, you think God just delivered them, and they're looking for idols so soon. So Right away, thousands upon thousands of years ago, we see idols start to pop up in the scriptures. And if you really want to get into the meat of the, the, the really heart of it, this is something that Egypt, Egyptians were big on. They were big on idols. Everything that they saw, they had to account for. So if the sun was, I don't know what the sun came from, there must be a sun god. They made an idol. And they, we, we need, you know, our crops and all that and our, and our vegetation. Well, there must be a god for that. And oh, live things and living animals. Well, let's make a god for that. So they had gods for everything and they worshiped everything. So when the people of God went into the, the Egypt and they were bondage, what they did, they wound up taking a little bit of that, of the, of the personality of the people. They started taking it and they started doing these things too. So this was what they want. So even though God had done signs and wonders, they reverted back to who they were. Basically, they reverted back to really honestly the flesh. And, and so you see over and over there are accounts of, of idols. That if you go through a, in Samuel's time, if you go through, if you go into where the kings and all the kings after David and Solomon and all of them, Jeroboam, and all of them, you see, and I'll read, I'll read something for you really quickly. You don't have to read it, but it's in 2 Kings chapter 17, so you don't take my word for it, right? It says, Now it came about that the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. This is in 2 Kings 17. And, but they followed after the customs of the nation whom the Lord had driven them out of the sons of Israel and the customs of the kings of Israel, which they had introduced and the sons of Israel, watch this, did things secretly against the Lord their God, which, were the, which they were not right. So, so they're saying they would go to church and be like Israelites, but the Bible also says that secretly they did things that were wrong too. They were basically playing the both sides of the fence. The Bible says in verse 9, Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all of their towns from the watchtowers to the fortified cities. And they set up memorial stones for Asherim on every high hill. And every These are God's people. See, idols are uh, this thing that have been plaguing them over and over. And then they say they burned incense on all the high places. And all the nations did uh, that, that, all the, that the Lord had told them, don't do these evil things provoking the Lord. They served idols. The Bible even tells us that they would even have their children serve the idols. The Bible tells us they would even make their children do things. It was, it was a crazy time. Psalm 106, serves, 106 verse 36 says, And they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. God's people did these crazy things, these idols, and you keep seeing, the, you can't get rid of idols. I don't know if you've ever read the account in Acts chapter 17 when, when, um, when Paul comes to Athens. And, and the, at that time, history tells us there were more idols than people. It was idols everywhere. See, idols have been plaguing humanity for a long time. 
this thing idolatry. And they would sacrifice to these idols and sacrifice to these idols and sacrifice to these idols. I read some commentary on it, and the reason why they say this was is because they believe that idolatry was, was guaranteed. You saw the God that you made. You saw the God that you made. You, 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 pour, you made it, you did it, and it's, this is my God. This is who I'm going to serve. So it was something that was easy. It was quick. You could do whatever you want to these idols. You could make up your own uh, oaths, your own uh, chants, your own offerings, whatever you wanted to do. I made it, so I'm going to make the rules for this idol. So that's one of the ways. Uh, it also says that, you know, uh, uh, idolatry in that time, that they did it because it was a selfish thing, right? You, can, you, you make your God, you pray to your God, you treat your God good, and then you'll experience something in return, right? Right? I bless you, God. You, you idol, you bless me, idol. They, they did all these things. How about this? Idolatry was easy. It's easy to be snared in idolatry, right? You, the vain religious activity, you can live your life, do whatever you want to do. So I try, idolatry has been in this over, it's been a part of humanity over and over and over. And so I was thinking and meditating on this thing about sacrifices and idols and how the enemy would always ensnare God's people for thousands of years. I couldn't help but, but think to myself, man, not a lot has changed. I love you, church. But not a lot has changed. Because I can't help but be stirred in my spirit that idolatry and the worship of idols is as alive today as it was 2,000 years ago. This practice of sacrificing to things that we make with our own hands. Church, we can come here and we can play church, but the truth of the matter is there are a great deal of us, and I have to deal with it, look in my own heart, that we are serving things that have nothing to do with the living God. We have carved and concocted and made things out for ourselves that make, it, make our religion easy. And I will even dare to say that some of us, are, are, have named our idols Jesus and have named our idols Jehovah. But it's an idol that we've made and we've fashioned. It's a thing that we want to do, and a, 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 a Jesus that we want to pray for on our own terms, a Jehovah that we want to serve on our own terms. I'm here to tell you that you can call it whatever you want, but that thing is a dead idol. It's as good as praying to this pulpit. It's as good as looking through this and saying, hey, bless me. I had to tell you, but I'm going to be straight with you. There is a devil and there are demons. And I'll even say there are plenty of devils and demons that stand behind those idols that we worship. Because I hate to tell you, but the enemy of our souls can bless your life a little bit too. Because he knows what your flesh wants. How many of you know that? Your flesh's greatest ally is not Jesus. Your flesh's greatest ally is the devil. He, he, he and your flesh get along really well. And you know that if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, because the things the Lord calls me to do, like Paul says, I don't want to do. There are things the Lord asks of me. I'm like, Lord, please, no, don't do that. But the things of the flesh, well, they feel good, don't they? They make me feel good. They feel right. No, don't you want to feel right? Don't the flesh, don't you want I don't know about you, sometimes you just want the flesh. I'm like, yes, I'll do it just to shut the, the flesh. Because you, you know when you're going through warfare in the flesh, you just want to stop for a minute? Like, yo, this is getting hard. So let me appease the flesh a little bit. See, a lot of people appease the flesh in the little, not understanding the devil's behind that. And, and, and we think, well, I'll do it a little bit. It'll be okay. I mean, to tell you, the devil's okay with a little bit. The enemy of your soul, he's okay with a little bit. He'll take a little bit of the flesh. He'll take a little bit. Let me align myself a little bit. Yeah, you can have the 90. I'll take the 10. It's fine. There are a lot of Christians that are not giving 100% because they're okay with, oh, well, God's okay with the 80%. I don't know about that. I don't know where that philosophy comes from. That thought. I'm here to tell you the devil's okay with 10, but the Lord is not. He's not okay with you giving 10% of yourself to the enemy. He's like, no, no, I don't want any. And have no part with that stuff. Are you with me this morning so far? Forgive me if I'm going to point out a few things, but idolatry is so real that, you know the Ten Commandments? Everybody knows the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments, the first commandment is, right? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He goes, what? You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first. Boom. 
He was like, this is such a big deal. The first commandment is, don't have anything else before me. And we want to be like, but God, but you don't under Nothing. Am I being too rough? I'm sorry. Nothing. See, the problem with our culture is, is this cultural Christianity thing that, that makes us believe that we can do the world and do God too. When he says, no other gods, period. Now, forgive me, but let's be plain, okay? You cannot play both sides of the fence, church. Get mad at me. I'm loving you. I'm, I, I have to give an account for what I tell you to you online, whatever. But there is no two sides to this game. There is no sides to this lifestyle. There is no side, two sides to this relationship. If I had a wife and a girlfriend, you would call me an adulterer, plain and simple. You wouldn't be like, but he only spends 10% of his time with the, with the girlfriend. You'd be like, no, you're an adulterer. Okay, 5%. I'll give her 10 minutes on the phone. No, that's adultery. The Bible says even if you lust, you're adult. If you spend your time thinking about that thing, boom. You went sideways. You're not giving me everything. You shall have no other gods, right? And then he goes on to say, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. He, so, so it's like God's like, if you don't understand that, let me break it down for you in the second commandment. Because, you know, we're stupid sometimes, right? One line wasn't good enough. You shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness that is in heaven. And then he gets into detail. Or in heaven, or on earth beneath, or in the water. You shall not worship nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. He's like, I'm trying to tell you. So if the first commandment you didn't understand, I'll give you the second commandment in this. It, 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 just so you understand. But here we go. Because we're people and we're dumb and we're stupid and we continue to want idols. And carve out idols and want to do things. With, we, we can't get it out of our head. When I, when, what blows me about the sacrifices in the days of old, and this is what provokes me, is that we walk around with our idols tucked away. We, we make them nice and fancy, whatever, but we don't realize what we're doing to the next generation. We don't understand. See, the problem is the, pow, the, the, the church has become powerless, right? And, and now there are all kind of reports starting to circulate that, that pastors are not... Um, they don't have a biblical worldview. That pastors are starting to have, like, pastors, like leaders are starting to have a wishy-washy worldview of the scriptures, right? So if, if pastors are having a bad idea, and then, and then for a long time we came to church and we would tell our, take our kids to kids' church thinking it was babysitting time, amen, right? Let, let send them over there to somebody, let them babysit the kids or whatever. We didn't think that that was going to come back to get us because now the kids are growing up without a biblical worldview. They're growing up not believing in God. They're growing up all twisted. The schools are getting them. The culture is getting them. And then, you know, what, you know what I feel like? It's like we as adults, we brought all our idols and we're trying to hide our idols like Achan. Y'all know Achan? He had to hide them under the thing. I'm going to hide it thinking our kids weren't going to see. Thinking the next generation wasn't going to see. Because now they're going to grow up worse than us. Can I be plain with you? Our kids are going to grow up worse than us. Have you looked at the world we created? Have you looked at it lately? Like, I'm from the, okay, don't judge me for what I'm about to say, okay? But I grew up with the Tupac and Biggie generation. I'm the, I'm a little too, too I'm a little too young for Run DMC. I'm not that old, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm from the Biggie and Tupac generation, and we sold our kids on bling and fancy cars and smoking and, and, and all this stuff, and we thought it was okay. It's just how we live our life. Yeah, we've made the next generation, the kids after us, have you listened to what they're listening to? Have you observed what they're watching? Like, it's like even I, like from, okay, cursing, I've been through all that with the music. Now I look at it like, well, what are we doing? What about the dude, I'm not going to say his name, that had that big old uh, outdoor, uh, uh, a part, uh, like a festival, whatever, and he outright said within, in, in the concert that he was opening up portals to, to darkness. And if you read the account of what happened, legit, it was chaos. People were dying. Things were like, yo, it's weird. We've opened up our world. We've opened up some things, and we've, we've, we've said it's okay for the sake of the arts. It's okay. It's just music. It's just music. No, no, let me tell you who's in charge of a lot of music. Uh, that Satan loves music too. 
And he's pumping a lot of junk into the ears of our children, and we've allowed these things to be so. And guys, I don't know if you know this, but secular people now are starting to want, sound the alarm for what they see in movies. Uh, again, I don't want to be the old guy that tells you don't listen to music, you know, because that's what they did when I was growing up. Don't listen to this, don't you know. And I thought these old people, whatever, they, they just don't understand. Well, let me tell you, I'm getting older now, and I think I understand. I think I understand. And you can't tell me things are not getting darker even in the arts. Guys, I don't know. I, 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 my wife and I have been watching. Okay, let me, let me, okay, I love you. I love you. But, but you look at Marvel when they had Captain America and Iron Man. It was cartoonish. You're like, oh, these are my comic books from kids growing, coming to life. Wow. Marvel now? You go, hmm, that don't look like the Marvel I grew up with. That don't look like the cartoonish Captain America. It's like once they set, once they closed that chapter of Marvel, they were like, watch what we do now. Like they were like, let's see how far we can push it. And it's not even like the goriness or the, I'm talking about the spiritual aspect. They're pushing spirituality into these things. They're pushing a darkness. I read an article, and again, I love you. Just hear me. I read an article by, by Christians that do things go deeper than I do that said that, yo, Dr. Strange's character is actually founded on, a, on, on an occult leader, a leader of the occult. And they, they, bring, they break it down like you got to see the similarities with these people. And you see then you go, an occult leader? You got teenagers. It's going back to sacrificing our children. We have teenagers. We, parents take our kids to see these movies, and we sit there. And this is what I'm talking about, sacrificing our children at altars of all this stuff coming down the pipe. And then we're wondering why our kids are lost. Then we wonder why our kids are, 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 are being, uh, being transferred right before our eyes. We're like, yeah, have you ever said this? What's wrong with that kid? You know what's wrong with that kid? The devil's got a hand on him. The devil's got him twisted and is moving in different things. And, 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 and that's why when I talk about sacrificing, I, 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 it, please hear me. It breaks my heart because the things we read about in the Old Testament with these altars and sacrificing their kids, the same way the devil was attacking and destroying the people of God in the Old Testament is the same way he's attacking and destroying the church of the New Testament. It may be dressed differently, but the attack is the same. Bring yourself to this idol. Bring yourself to that idol. Make yourself this idol. You bend down to it, and when you're there, bring your children too. It's the same thing they did in the Old Testament. It's the same thing they did in those things, and God's people allowed it to be. The Bible tells us God's people were the ones erecting the poles. God's people were the ones sacrificing to those false gods. And it breaks my heart to think we can come to a church this morning, we can be here, talk about the things of God, be in the atmosphere of worship, yet we open the door and allow these things into not only our lives, but to contaminate our children. And if you don't think the next generation is in trouble, church, you got to be, you, you don't, yeah. all these shootings that are happening, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and get into politics, but doesn't it provoke your mind to be like, most of them are happening by the hands of young people? Like what? going on with our young people? What's going on with the fact that the CDC at this point is not registering suicides right now? You know they're not publishing the suicide rate right now? What are you trying to hide? What's going on? You know, this whole pandemic, the whole thing, the ones that suffered, it wasn't adults. I think we managed okay, but our children were locked away for a year, two years on electronic devices. God knows what was coming down the pipe. And we're like, okay, it's all good. No, it's not all good. Guys, a, a, a quick footnote. You know that, that, um, that Bill Gates does not allow his children, he didn't allow his children when they were young to be on social devices, right? And that's his business. That should bother you. That should be like, what does he know that I don't know? Or, or what about, see, our new cycle, don't get caught in the new cycle. You remember the, the Facebook whistleblower? Y'all remember her? Google the Facebook whistleblower and you go home. Google it. She came out and said that Mark Zuckerberg and his conglomerate have studies that prove that Instagram is no good for our children. They, can, they prove it. Nobody cared. You know what we cared about? Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. 
We care about Chris Rock getting slapped. We care about, guys, if you fall for this surface level stuff, you will never, you will never see the truth because that culture is not trying to tell you the truth. If, if, if that lady, she came, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg knows it. They know this is bad. You think they care? Who are they feeding Instagram to? I ain't on Instagram. Who's got time for Instagram? TikTok. You think I'm going to be doing a t- TikTok video? <laughs> if you ever see that, you know it. <laughs> That's an imposter. That can't be. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Dancing and all this. <laughs> nah. I was at Ino on Friday, and I had the opportunity to spend time with the young ladies. And it's funny how the young people, I pray God keep them, they looked at me and told me, says, Pastor Sam, this is what it is. says, you know, the culture has young people chasing a fad. And when they chase this new thing, it's already gone. Then it has them chasing another fad. Boom. And then it's gone. It's changing so fast. And, they're, and you got young people that are trying to chase, and they're changing themselves to be what they see. They're shifting who they are, what they look like, how they think. They're doing things that are not normal. They're doing things out of pressure. They're doing things because they think this is normal. They're, and, they're, and they're just going like this, and the devil's sitting there laughing. And you know, the pro- here's, here's the problem. The older ones are not the ones saying, hey, alarms, this is not good. You know what we do? Oh, here's the new iPhone 15. Here's the newest iPad. Here's the newest thing. Here's your Wi-Fi. Take a, kid, take a kid's Wi-Fi. Watch how they flip out on you. They probably care more about the Wi-Fi than getting fed, some of them. You know what I mean? But that's real because their whole life is connected. And they're judging their whole lives and what they see. Church, I'm, I, for, again, for, that stuff is demonic. Some of that, um, most of that, 95, 98% of the stuff that we're consuming right now is demonic. I don't care what you put on the TV. I don't care what you put in your ears. It's hard to find wholesome stuff. Hard. Okay? Try opening Hulu or Disney Plus right now. And what's the first thing you see? Pride. Not for my eight-year-old, you're not going to just hit him with that nonsense. Go to Barnes & Noble right now. Go to Target right now. But, 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 but they make fun of me because I'm a Christian. Or they beat me down and berate me because I'm a Christian. You know that the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, right? You know, you know sad in my heart because baseball is into LGBT. So they got things all over their uniforms. There were some players that said, I don't want that in my uniform. They belittled them. How dare you not put the flag? How did? And the guy came out and said, I don't hate, but... I'm trying to live my life according to Scripture. That culture out there is going to make us look bad, insensitive, intolerant. It's going to make us look bigoted or whatever. And you know why? Because they want to put you in a box. You and me, they want to put us in a box and hey, you are going to you are going to serve my idols, whether you like it or not, and your children too. But we have to stop and say, you know what? Time out. Time out. One second. You see, this is where the voice of the church and the voice of saved people and the voice of the lion need to. See, the problem is, the Bible says, again, I said it earlier, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when I look at it, you ever been to a zoo when a lion roars? Have you ever heard a lion roar? I'm here to tell you, you can hear that thing from around the zoo. Everybody takes note, like, bang, that wasn't a gazelle, that wasn't a zebra. You know what just roared right there. When a lion roars. When a lion roars. So, and we serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. And my king roars a lot. Maybe in my personal time, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you and me are different. But my God has something to say. The one that I serve, he's not silent. The one that I serve is not quiet and docile, put him in a corner kind of God. Maybe your God is like that, but my Jesus ain't like that. My Jesus has something to say, and my Jesus is looking for a church that is willing to stand up and say, Lord, I'll be about what you're about. I'll speak what you speak. I'll be who you called me to be. I'll do what you called me to do. You know, we got this idea like we're supposed to be cool with everybody. Jesus was an outcast. Let's remember. Even people in the religious community looked at him like, what's up with this guy? So why are we looking to be all comfortable all the time? 
There are going to be times when you're going to be at your job, and they're going to be trying to get you to do this and do that and do that, and you, sorry, but you're going to have to stand by yourself all alone and stand there and be like, no. I'll be the one guy that says no. The problem is, is that a lot of church people are as quiet and stupid as sheep. That world is full of sheep. They just follow wherever the culture leads them. They go wherever the culture goes. Oh, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do. The Lord did not call you, call you to ride the coattails of the culture. The Lord did not call you to be like them, to act like them, to be a sheep like them. Huh. Am I making sense this morning a little bit, church? If the Lord is roaring, if he is a lion, if he is mighty, strong, and fearless, then guess what? We are called to be like that too. And if you have to walk around all Jersey City and nobody wants you to pray for me, it don't matter. I'm going to pray for you anyway. I'm going to walk around here with my Bible in my hand. This week I'm bringing my big Bible and we're going to walk around. I'm going to probably quote scriptures as you walk up and down the street. Who cares? Crazy people can walk around talking to themselves. Why can't I? <laughs> I'm just going to be talking around. And you know what? Sometimes you got to talk to the atmosphere. Sometimes the devil, the Bible says, we wrestle against flesh and blood, principalities according to this world. Sometimes you got to talk to the principality. And let me tell you something, because I walked around Cambridge Avenue. I did two, two walks around this block, and I said, Lord, I want this block. This church should be full of people that can just walk here. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. This church should be full of people just from the heights. Just from the heights. There are so many people that are right here that need you. I was walking down, and you could just, you know, if you, if you walk with the Lord long enough, and as you start to look at the doors, you start to worry and think and pray like, Lord, what's going on behind that door? The hopelessness. The brokenness. There are people that when you walk by and you do a prayer walk, and if you close, you can feel pain on the other side of the door. Where are the people that are going to walk around and speak peace over their community? And those people don't even know where the peace came from. I know where it came from. I know where it came from. It came from the fact that there are people that are willing to stand in the gap for people we don't even know. Isn't that what Jesus did? People, he didn't know their name, but he's like, I'm going to this cross anyway. You know what, the, what blows my mind about the Bible and about the things of the Lord? Is that he did all this for us and some people will never receive him. Yet he went to the cross anyway. For you and for me. <laughs> but we... We, all of us, have to get this through our head. We have to. We must get rid of the things that we're bowing our knee to that are robbing God of his glory and robbing us of something too. I don't know about you, but I just think in my head, you can't tell me that you're going to get the fullness of God bowing your knee to an idol. You can't tell me that God is going to share his presence with an idol, and, we, and that ain't going to work like that. Am I making sense? Does that make sense what I just said? You can't come and play religious games. You can't come and, and concoct some kind of Christianity for yourself thinking that you're doing God a service. You are not doing God a service. What you're doing is you're doing yourself. You're deceiving yourself. I am the Lord, and I do not want any other God before me. End of story. So these little things that we're messing around with, these little games that we're playing, we need to get rid of them. I was reading an article by a church planter named Jeffrey Poor. He identified one of the key factors, one of the idols that we have in our generation, and it's so true. He said identity. We're so, and especially in 2022, everybody wants to be who they want to be. And I want to identify who I want to identify as. And you can't tell me nothing. That's the world we're living in right now. I'm going to be who I want to be. I want to do this how I want to do it. See, the problem with that is, is that you, aren't, you can't be who you want to be because you didn't create you. If you have a lump of Play-Doh, you can make whatever you want, and you can call it whatever you want. It could be a horse. You can call it a man. It can be a, a, a blob of ro it just be a ball. You can call it a, a, a square. I don't care. You made it. It's yours. Go for it. The problem is, is that our identity is not for us to define. I'm not, I can't look at you and be like, well, today I feel like you look like a girl. That's not for me to say. It's not for the culture to say. I, I can't even look in the mirror and call myself something. Well, I want to be a dog today. 
I want to be a cat today. God did not create me to be a cat today and a dog tomorrow and a girl this day and a boy that day and do whatever. No, he, that's not how I would, that's how not you, that's not how the, everybody walking around this world was created. But the problem is we got into our mind of, I want to do me though. It started with Eve, right? Here, take this, eat this. At that minute when she took the eat, she, what she was saying was, I'm going to do me. And what has doing me got us? Adults, you ever try to do you? You ever have that five year? I'm gonna do me. I'm gonna take care of me. I'm gonna take it and watch the whole thing come crumbling down right before your eyes. Thinking about, boy, I thought I had a good plan. Yeah, you thought you had. The problem is in our futile thinking. The Bible says we became. We thought we were so wise. In our world, everybody's trying to define. They're trying to look in the mirror and define themselves. Church, you can't define yourself. You are not called to define. Let, let, let me break it down for you. Your identity is in this. The Lord created you. In your mother's womb, he created you. The Bible says while you were in your mama's belly, he had a plan and purpose for your life. He did that. Your mama didn't do that. Your dad didn't do that. Your pastor didn't pray for something. The Lord said, I'm putting a baby girl in there. I know her name, and I know her, well, her destiny. I know who she's called to be. I put this boy in there. And the Bible also says he gave purpose for that boy. He gave purpose for that girl. You know when the devil wants, and we got to come out here, and our, our passports can't have, no, it got to be gender fluid. No, no, when the Lord, I hate to tell you, but when we stand before the Lord, he's going to be like, what have you done with what I gave you? Not what you called yourself. When I get to stand before the Lord, he's not going to go, well, boy, girl, whatever you called yourself, I gave you stuff. I gave you treasures and giftings. I gave you a calling. What did you do with what I gave you? Well, I wanted to be me, Lord. I wanted to feel, I wanted to be out in that world, and I wanted to feel how good. Lord's going to look at that. Let me tell you something. This is going to be a mighty surprise when we get to glory and people, how they feel. Now, forget about picking on those people. What about us Christians? Well, I don't feel like worshiping today. Huh? I don't feel like praying today. I don't feel like talking to the Lord. Let me tell you, I don't care on your good day, on your bad day, your best day, your worst day. You should always give up because your, your identity is in the creator. My daughters carry a last name. It's mine. That's how you identify them with me. Whose daughter... Go- Olivia Grace Lopez, her daddy, my name is on her birth certificate. My name, she belongs to me. The same application is spiritually. We walk before the Lord and we're going to have to, right, he said, we're going to have to give account. Right, I gave you 10, I gave you 20, I gave you 10. Here, here it is. Lord, the Lord's going to look at us and say, I gave you, I, ga- I gave you. The world didn't give you, the culture didn't give you, your mind, you're the, well, I get, what did you do? Church, we're going to have to answer for that. And you're going to have to answer for your worship. You're going to have to answer for your calling, your gifting, church people. Because some church people walk around like, oh, I'm good. Pastor Sam got it. Darren got it. Pastor Ren got it. Pastor Carl. We all got it. Everybody's got it. They got worship. They got this. I hate to tell you, it's not about what we got. I do what I do for the Lord. I, I, I'm thankful he's allowed me to minister in this capacity. But I hate to tell you, this right here, this whole church thing ain't about me. It ain't about Ms. Tyron or Pastor Red, Pastor Carl, Pastor Mary. It's about us. And I hate to tell you that this church is limping along as long as some people don't want to be used by God. Limping, I want you to think about what I'm saying. The church is not effectively moving forward because some of us are pulling and some of us are just like, I'm along for the ride. The Bible says that the, the body is a living organism. Some of us may be the, the mouth, the ears, the head, the mouth, whatever. Some may be the feet. Some, but we all got to be doing something for the Lord here, church. Amen. Maybe that's one of the idols that we need to kick down this morning, that you know what, this idol of religion, that I just come to church just to do church. I hate to tell you, the church is not a building. The church is not just come and sit and listen. That's not church. We are the church. We are the body. We together make up this body of Christ that moves and lives and it breathes in the things of him and it activates and it does. We. We. So if some of us are pushing this thing and some of us are limp, then we're a paralyzed body just getting by. 
and it shouldn't be so. So maybe one of the idols we need to, idols we need to kick today over is this, this idol of religion, church going, and we need to stop that. Am I making sense this morning, church? Identity is one of those things we need to, to cut down. Uh, cultural relevance is another thing we need to cut down. Church, the United States is obsessed with being entertained. We love to be entertained. You know the problem with that is? How many of us like to sit in silence? I got one person. Praise God. That's because you got kids at home. <laughs> so you like, I love silence. I, I understand. I'm not kicking on that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge you. But here's the problem. Listen to me. We are so accustomed to noise and being entertained and being coddled. See, th there's something to be said about being able to sit in silence before the Lord. There's something to be said about just sitting. You know, one of the love languages is, is quality time. You know, love languages, y'all can read it, go read it. Um, and quality time goes like this. You don't have to say nothing to me. You don't have to do anything for me. Just sit here with me. There's something about the presence of a loved one that can just sit in the atmosphere. Have you ever been, like, like you could be like, I'll speak to the guys. Have you been a guy, you macho, you tough, you got all, you tough, whatever. But like, your grandmother brings you peace. Don't judge me because it happens to me, okay? Don't judge me. The, like, it could be my children. It could be the smallest thing. It doesn't have to be this big, imposing person that brings me peace. But the presence of somebody I really, really love, when they're next to me, it changes the atmosphere around me. I just, shh. And the problem is that the world is getting so loud. The world is so loud. We have devices that make it easy to be entertained everywhere we go, anywhere we go, at any time we want. Our streaming services can give us anything. Now the big thing, obviously, is when you binge watch something. Some of us could binge watch a whole five, six seasons of a show in a few days. Just binge watch and go and go and go and go. And if you're not careful, you, 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 you'll be entertained so much, so much noise, so much volume, so much coming in that, that, that you'll be afraid of silence. It'll be foreign to you. But dare I say that, that the Lord loves to move in silence. That there is something that happens when you can sit in the presence of the Lord and not have the radio on. The, ha, ha, church, have you ever been in the presence of the Lord in your car where, where, where you don't want any music on? I just want to be, I'm alone right now, it's me and him. Boom. And I just want to sit in the parking lot before I go into church. I just, I just want to move from this moment. I keep talking to you guys about the secret place, right? The holy of holies, this secret place, the, the prayer closet. I, I can't help but to think a lot of us spend so little time there is because we're not entertained there. We don't know what it is to just sit there and be in his presence. We, we want, Lord, say something. Lord, do something. Somebody give me a worship song. Somebody help me. Help you. You think anybody needs to help me be in the presence of my daughters or my wife? Just be here with me. No matter what we're doing, just be here. But we're so entertained. We're, 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 again, our smartphones are becoming an addiction, all these things, and, and we're, we're so caught up. These idols. These idols. What about the idol of comfort? Comfort. Just this, you know, you know we live in a world, like I said earlier, Wi-Fi. If, if a plane doesn't have Wi-Fi, that is the worst flight of your life. If you go into somebody's house and your phone service is bad, don't you be like, yo, who's got the Wi-Fi? <laughs> yo, you got the Wi-Fi? Hit me with the Wi-Fi. I got to be, we just want to be so comfortable, right? We got to, we got to, the air has got to be just perfect. It's got to be so perfectly hot, perfectly. My car has got to be this. You got to be that. Uh, my food's got to be, you know, we, we, and there's nothing wrong with all those things in and of, of, of themselves. But, but, but the problem is, is that, is that we get so caught in the pursuit of being comfortable and making ourselves comfortable. We get so, so comfortable that when the Lord asks us for the difficult thing, we're like, ah. But sacrifice this comfort? Ah. Lord, I don't know. Lord, I, I don't front like I'm not the only person that says to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that way. Am I the only person? I'll speak for me. It's all right. Because I don't know about me because when I think life is going like, ooh, this is chilling, this is chilling, like the bottom falls out. And the Lord's like, hey, time to go to work. I'm like, but everything was going so good. 
Life was so good. Everything was flowing. And I, I, again, I'll speak for my, my people who are in ministry. When ministry is all good or whatever, then all of a sudden it's like everything's getting smacked up at one time. You're like, what, Lord, what happened? And sometimes like, well, the devil's attacking. The devil's attacking. No, it's not the devil. Maybe the Lord is like, hey, you're a little, little too comfortable right now. And, uh, you know, because when we get comfortable, let's be honest, we don't pray as hard. You know, anybody know any, any panic prayer people? We are amazing prayer warriors when we need stuff from the Lord. But when we're comfortable, ah, that time in that prayer closet, it's not, so, it's not as convenient as it used to be. But our worship is not as intense as it is. I don't know. There's something about when the Lord breaks you, when he takes you through some difficult waters. I don't know about you, but that worship is different. Those prayers are different. Reading your Bible when you're heartbroken, that's a different level of reading your Bible, if you know what I'm saying. You know, sometimes I, there are times where you got, I got to pry the book open because I don't want to be here, Lord. You're hurting me too much, Lord. Why, Lord? Why, Lord? Why, Lord? But I want to remind you, church, that, that uh, the true intimacy doesn't happen in your comfort zone. True intimacy, true, 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 intimacy, true, true, true uh, moments with the Lord, those moments happen in the difficult times. And I believe the Lord drives, I, I'm, honestly, I, the Lord drives us to difficulties because he understands, well, that's where you're going to hear me. You're going to hear me when things are rough. You're going to hear me when people are in the hospital. You're going to hear me when you're physically going through. You're going to, your voice is going to be really, really loud then. Those moments. Not the comfortable days. Not the, and I, church, I don't know about you, but we live in a world where, where we're being fed comfort, comfort, comfort everywhere that we go. Do this and it'll be easy. Do this and it'll be easy. Do this and it'll be easy. Lord, the Lord Jesus never said it was going to be easy. He said, broad is the road and many go through it. But that way leads to destruction, he said. But the narrow road, hard and difficult. That's the road that belongs to you. The problem is there are not many Christians that are, that are saying, yeah, I'll get my feet calloused on that road. I'll deal with the blisters on that road. No, we want to be like, but that road, Lord, but it looks so good. On that road, Lord, I'll evangelize for you. I'll sing worship on that road. The Lord, Lord's like, man, please spare me. There are going to be a lot of people that talk a good game, that talk about the good, they talk about the Lord, they'll be singing, and they're all going to be on their way to hell, church. Idols. Sacrifices, idols, and altars. Church, there are a lot of idols in our lives. Some of us, we concoct altars of our own making. The Lord is not there. He's not there. And it breaks my heart to think that people are praying to a God they don't even know. They're praying to something that they've made, and the Lord's just sitting there saying, I'm here waiting for you. I'm here. Just come and speak to me. Tear down all those things that you've put between us. <laughs> Therefore, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, by mercies of God, present your bodies as a living, and he says, a holy sacrifice. Saying, this is the sacrifice that I desire. You know what the sacrifice is? It is you sitting with me in this holy space. But it's going to require you tearing apart the things. And this is what I believe. The Lord has not put obstacles in the way between us and him. We have put obstacles in the way of us and him. We have put things in the way. We have made concocted things to get to Jesus and to get to God. And it isn't so. It's very plain. The Lord calls us, come to me. All you are heavy, weary. And I will give you rest, he said. Rest for your soul. Things that the world is not allowed to, the Lord can't, the world can't give you. But present yourself as a living and holy sacrifice. You are the sacrifice. You are the holy thing. You, church, you, every individual here, are the holy thing the Lord is looking for. You are the thing that he's looking for. And he's looking for you at a holy place. He's looking for you at a holy altar, not the altars we've set up. He's looking for you at that holy place. And he's saying, come meet with me here. This, uh, this past Thursday, I had the incredible, and this is going to be weird for me to say, but I had an, the honor at going to a funeral on Thursday. And you may say, that's the dumbest. Why would you say that? I went to Debbie's dad's funeral. 
Not know Debbie Lizardo from the Spanish department. Her dad passed away. Last Sunday, she called me in the back and she said, Pastor, pray for my dad. He's 97. He's not doing so well. He, he was in a nursing home. Then he got COVID. Went to the hospital. Got COVID. Never really got better. And so that later that night at 5 o'clock, he passed away. 97. Served the Lord. I go to the funeral on Thursday. I speak to Debbie during the week, and she's, a, you know, obviously she's grieving. I go to the funeral, and this was a funeral that, have you ever been to a funeral where, you know, you go and they're like, here lies this amazing person, but you know the person? And you're like, he wasn't anything like that. <laughs> like, that's not the, you're talking about two different people because, you know, but, you know, our pastors, we got to make stuff up, you know what I mean? We got to make things happen. Don't judge us, you know what I mean? But what are we going to do? We can't be like, this dude was a thief. He was horrible, this guy. You know, we all got to say the same thing. Well, he's going to meet Jesus, bro. I know he met Jesus. That dude, and it didn't go good. But we can't say stuff like that. We can't say stuff like that. We want to say stuff like that, but we can't say stuff. <laughs> but when, when, I, when I went to Debbie's dad, his name was Ephraim, uh, my brother David's grandfather, um, I was taken aback about how they talked about him. They talked about this man with such honor and reverence. I got to be honest, Dave, I'm not sure, but I didn't see a lot of tears in the house. I didn't see people weeping over the casket. I didn't see people going, oh my God, he's gone. I saw people go, I know where this man is right now. Legit, like everyone that spoke, everyone that you spoke to, everyone that you talked to is like, no, but you don't understand who this man was. Like, tell me about the man. Like, this this man, Debbie was telling me while he was in the hospital, he was there and he's sick and he's not doing well. He's in pain or whatever. And through his pain, he's trying to tell people, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? 97. Do you know Jesus? In the hospital, in pain, broken. His body's failing him. Hey, you got to know Jesus. You have. He was an evangelist in the bed. Everyone that walked in, hey, do you know Jesus? The nurses, do you know? And Debbie was telling me, she's like, oh, my God, my dad doesn't stop talking about Jesus. Like, even she was like, everybody that he came in contact, I got to talk to you about Jesus. I got to talk to you about Jesus. We get there. I'm at the funeral. And then the pastor, another old-time white-haired man talks. And he's like, yeah, I'm the pastor of this church. But my brother, if I am, he used to wake me up in the morning and say, hey, we got to go evangelize. He's like, evangelize? I got to, like, no, we going out to talk to people. Here's this man. And, and everybody's like, this guy. Without fail, everybody that got up there, this was a man of God. This was a man. And everyone to a man says, I know where he is. There was like not even an ounce of second thought. I know where this man is right now. I know where he is. I know what he's doing. And I can't wait to see him when I get to glory. And I'm sitting there going, and I'm telling you, it was standing room only. Right, David? It was sta standing. People, I was like, and I'm sitting there going, this is how it should be done. This is what it looks like when a saved, a really saved person passes away, when they die on this earth. Because everybody in the room was like, that's just, and I think even the pastor said it, that's just the body right there. He's not there. He's in glory right now. And, and, and you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, I should be weeping right now. Everybody's like, yeah. And then they're passing us up and preaches a mess. I'm like, now I want to get saved all over again. This is amazing right here. I'm thinking to myself, this is how it's got to go down in my funeral. I want y'all to know when, my, when we ain't doing that crying stuff. What? Because I, and I, can't, I, I, I thought to myself, there's a man, there's a man who gave it all for Jesus. And he didn't have to do the talking. Everyone could sit there and testify to the goodness of God in that man. And I thought to myself, God, God, to make, to make more men like that, to get more men to be in that place. There's a man who, I, as I preach this, I know had, didn't have idols in his life. Here's a man that I know lived his life at the altar of the Lord. Here's a man that didn't spend time wasted sending his kids off to this. I, I'm, I'm not mistaken, all of his kids were saved. All of his kids were saved. And when he saw his grandkids, the ones that weren't saved, and he got multiple grandkids that were saved, they were all in the place. And the ones that weren't saved, he's looking at them like, what are you waiting for? 
Debbie told me, he's like, yo, he didn't mess around even to the grandkids. And, and, and it, it made me think about the, 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 the scriptures of I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of, of multiple generations. God does mo- amazing things when people step out and they really mean business with God. And they're not bowing their, their knee down to faulty altars or false gods or false things. But they really take hold of the things of God and say, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to give you everything that I have. All my worship is going to be for you. My life, my devotion is all. I'm I'm going to be this living sacrifice. I'm going to be this holy sacrifice. I'm not going to prostrate myself or put my knee down to an altar that's false. I'm going to tear down everything that has exalted itself against you. And I'm going to give you everything. Church, there is coming a time when the Lord is going to come. And there's going to be, I believe, in that final day, there's going to be lines there. And the Bible says that Jesus says there's going to be a day where he's going to separate those whom he knows and those who think they know him. But there's going to be people who, who know his voice, who walk with him, who talk with him, who have relationship. There are going to be those who, who were not afraid to tear down altars. Listen, some of us in this room have multi-generational idols in our lives. Some of us have multi-generational things that people have, haven't put in our life, you know, like pain. Some people have altars of pain. Do you know that? Like they, they get so caught up in their trauma that they build an altar to the trauma. Like, oh, boo-hoo, look at this, man. Get over that nonsense. Get over that trauma. Break that down. Understand that the Lord is your healer, and you don't have to walk in that junk anymore. But some of us have walked in junk for so long we don't even know what healing looks like and that could be an altar we could have a, an altar of relationships some of us are bowing our knee to relationships that are not of the lord and you're there and you're like but this is it god this is it and god's at another altar saying hey you missed it Am I making sense this morning? I don't mean to yell at you. I don't mean to get animated, but, but I, I can't help but to think that, again, some of us are going to stand before the Lord one day like my brother did uh, on, on, thir- on last Sunday, and, and we're going to stand there, and, and the Lord's going to, again, make an account. What did you do? And some of us are going to have a lot of excuses. But, Lord, you don't know what they did to me. And the Lord's going to look at you, and he's going to say something like, you never heard the words like, I am your healer? You never heard the words of, 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 of I can give you rest. You never heard, the, you've never experienced my spirit. Some of us are going to get up there and have excuses, but Lord, the pastor didn't tell me my life. Oh, oh, pastor didn't say good morning. I'm mad at him, so he messed me up. Let me tell you something. You're not here. Your salvation doesn't rest on a pastor or a man or a leader. Your salvation has nothing to do with what it's about you and Jesus. Let me tell you something right now. If you're in this room and you're hurt because somebody hurt you, man, get over it. You're big people. Get over some of that stuff and start walk. Pick up your cross and follow the Lord. Walk with him. Talk with him. Don't worry about what people did. Don't worry about what people did in the past you got to get over some of that stuff. Some of us, again, have altars of hurt and pain, and we're bowing, and we're there, and we're crying. And the Lord's like, I went to a cross for that. The Bible says we have a, we have a high priest that sits at the right hand who has gone through all of the things that we, he has he's dealt with that. But we want to stay there in our pity party, in our mess. We want to stay there in our trauma and our, in our past and our doubts. And the Lord's like, no, those days are over. Moving past that. Am I making sense this morning, church? A few more minutes, I promise. I'm timing myself, I promise. Church, we have to come to a place where we play everything to the side. All of our stuff, all of our junk. And we say, yes, Lord, did I choose you. The Bible says it like this, Jesus speaking. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. Deny his idols, deny his baggage, deny his stuff, deny his junk, tear down the things that are not of God. And the problem is, church, don't say, well, I don't know what's right and wrong. You've been under some good teaching. You've been on some good stuff where you know what's right and wrong. You know what you should be doing. So, so some of us want to hold on to our junk so hard that we're, 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 you're not denying yourself. You're, you're actually indulging yourself is what you're doing. But Jesus said you must deny yourself. Deny yourself of those altars. Deny yourself of those idols. Get away from those things. Take up your cross and follow me. Meaning, you know what? It's time for you to lay down all the stuff, your comforts, all the stuff you think are good. I want you to stop all that nonsense, and I want you to take. I want you to p- pick up this what, what I've called you to do, and just follow me. That's it. 
This is what he said. That's it. He says, whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do for a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? What will a person give in exchange for his soul? For the, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and he will repay every person according to their deeds. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. Deny what you think you're supposed to look like, your identity, blah, 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 blah. Deny yourself whatever the world's trying to encroach upon you, whatever the culture's trying to get you to do. Deny yourself. Put those things down and say, Jesus, I choose you and whatever you want for me. Whatever you want to do with my life. Whatever you have for my life, Lord, here it is. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, present your bodies, everything that you are, everything that you were about, your identity, your life, your worries, your baggage, present all that you are as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. That is your spiritual service of worship. That's your worship. Here I am. Some of you in this room have a twist in thinking that worship is about a song. It has nothing to do with the song you sing. The worship, it's you. You could sing the song really low and whisper. The Lord hears that worship. You. You could sing loud and out of tune. The Lord doesn't care what you sound like in the song and if you're on cue. You're the worship. Lord, here's my life. I offer it to you at this altar. Josh, you can come, please. Am I making sense this morning, church? If we don't Get these things right, church. It's not only about us as adults. It's for the generations that follow. Our children. Our children's children. I, I witnessed this week at a funeral a man who chose the Lord with all his heart. I saw his children impacted by that decision, and I saw his children's children impacted by that decision to deny himself, pick up his cross, Lay himself down at the altar of the Lord, and the Lord used it for his glory. I witnessed it. See, the Lord is not about just you. Again, it's the generations upon generation upon generation. What will you do this morning? What will you do this morning? The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Let's bow our head and close our eyes.